Hi, my name's Dave Huxtable. It's been a while since my last video, but I'm determined to make them regularly from now on. In this episode, I'm going to be exploring the language of young people and how it fuels language change. So here goes. Oi, welcome good. Name me Dave. Me na belta mi inya, ba mi ando junya young belta. Eh? Toloda na pochuye ke? Toloda na sasa young belta ke? If you didn't understand what I just said, don't worry. You've got 350 years to catch up. The language I was speaking is called Lang Belta, and it's a conlang, or constructed language, created by linguist Nick Farmer for the science fiction TV series The Expanse. The premise is that a few hundred years in the future, humans have colonized the solar system. Earth is united under a UN government, and Mars is an independent colony. A group of poor, lawless, and oppressed people eke out an existence, mining the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. They're called Belters, and their ancestors came from all over the world. As a result, they speak a Creole language, which developed from a pidgin with elements of English, other Germanic languages, and the Slavic, Chinese, and Niger Congo language families. That's how new languages and new language varieties are born. And I think the creators of the TV program are right to imagine that that's how the languages of the future will be, very multicultural, and indeed, these languages are being created now. Sometimes, kids can create a language out of next to nothing. In Nicaragua, before about the 1970s, there was no real deaf community to speak of. Deaf and hearing impaired children were very isolated from one another. Those who were unable to learn spoken language communicated with friends and family through gesture and minimal home sign systems. This started to change in 1977, when a Centre for Special Education was set up in Managua. A second school was established in 1980, forming a combined community of about 400 kids. Teachers tried to teach the children Spanish, lip-reading and finger-spelling, but without much success. The magic was happening in the playgrounds, the surrounding streets and on the school buses. The children were combining and building on their home sign systems and soon developed a pidgin sign language. As time went on, younger kids learnt this pidgin as their first language, and the process of creolization kicked in. The staff at the schools didn't know what was happening, and couldn't communicate with the kids. In 1986, they brought in a sign language expert from MIT, who confirmed that the children had created a fully-fledged, complex language with verb agreement and an extensive vocabulary. This language is known as El Idioma de Señas de Nicaragua, or Nicaraguan Sign Language. As well as being the creators of new languages, young people are also the chrysalis of language change. In one sense, that seems obvious. But I don't know about you, often when I imagine how a language like English came about, I tend to think of adults adapting their speech and taking on new influences. In fact, though, after a bit of reflection, it's the kids and young people. As Germanic tribes people moved to Britain, each speaking different varieties of Anglish and Saxon and Jutish, it was the kids who started speaking some new blend of all of them, which then turned into different kinds of Old English. 300 years later, when Norse speakers started settling in parts of Britain, it was the great 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 grandkids of those kids who started forgetting their verb endings and noun declensions and using strange Nordic borrowings like egg and sky and they. For those Anglo-Saxon youths who started sprinkling their speech with such Vikingisms, Nordic words must have made them feel cool and trendy. Slang is a marked feature of youth speech in many languages. We can define it as words or phrases which are markedly very informal in style often restricted to particular contexts or groups. Often with slang terms, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with a word in the wider, formal lexicon, 
an exact synonym whose only difference is in terms of formality. The French language has an interesting relationship with slang. Many common words have slang equivalents which are used pretty much all the time in informal contexts, often making the French we learn as foreigners rather redundant. This slang or argot doesn't really fit the definition of certain group, since it's actually used by the general population in informal contexts. Which kind of defeats the point of slang, really, which is to define identity, provide a sense of belonging, and create a separation between the in-group and the out-group. Luckily, French has a conveyor belt of terms which start off as urban youth slang and then either get picked up by wider society or die out, which is the fate of most slang terms. They have to be short-lived so that keeping up with which words are in or out shows that you're still in the groove, man. New slang terms are coined to fill in the void. As urban centres around the world become increasingly multicultural and multilingual, slang terms often originate in other languages. For example, kife in French, which now means to like, originally comes from the Moroccan Arabic word for a kind of cannabis. Also, le serme, meaning regret, originally is originally from Arabic sam, meaning poison. Another subgroup of French youth slang is le verlan, which involves saying syllables backwards, a surefire way to confuse the parents, at least at first. So the slang term for police officer, flic, becomes que fli, normally shortened to keuf. Femme, woman, becomes meuf. Words can even be double verlanized, so meuf becomes fameux. Language change is often seen as a slow, almost imperceptible process, but sometimes it can happen incredibly quickly. The East End of London has been the place of arrival for migrants into England for hundreds of years. The Huguenot, Jewish people, Chinese people, I'm sure all of these contributed to the uniqueness of London English. Recently, though, this part of London has developed its own language variety with incredible speed during our lifetimes. In many families, we have the following situation. Some people's grandparents speak traditional London English, otherwise known as Cockney. Other grandparents speak Caribbean Creole languages or varieties of Caribbean English. Yet others may speak Bengali, Punjabi or other South Asian languages, plus South Asian varieties of English. Their kids, the parents, invariably speak Cockney because they were born and raised in London. They may also be bilingual. The current generation, however, speaks something entirely new, a variety of English known as Multicultural London English, or MLE. In terms of accent, it is markedly different in some respects from Cockney. Coat, 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 face, 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 kite, 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 out, out, ah, food, 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 fear, 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 fat, fat, fat. As for grammar, if we look at the pronouns, we have man, which is mostly used to mean I, man's getting out of here, but it can also be used for the second and third person. Where's man going? A bit like how members of the royal family frequently use one. In it is a catch-all tag question. They was getting jealous though, innit? And an expression of agreement or confirmation. It weren't like it was an accident though, innit? There's always an interesting distribution of was and were around the British Isles. In the case of MLE, it gets particularly interesting in that was is used throughout for the affirmative and were is used for the negative. So we get I was, you was, he, she, it was, we was, they was, I weren't, you weren't, he, she, it weren't, we weren't, they weren't. If you're liking this so far, please subscribe to my channel and click on the bell icon to get notifications of when I upload new content. Quotatives are also remarkable. 
I was like, don't do it. And she was like, why not? This is me. Let's go. This is my mum. So soon. Similar multi-ethnolects are found among young, especially working class people in large, diverse cities in many countries. I've already alluded to multicultural Parisian French. We also find Kiezdeutsch, a form of German centered on the Kreuzberg and Neukölln areas of Berlin. Kiezdeutsch features creative slang and the systematic omission of articles and prepositions in certain contexts. For example, I'm going to school, ich gehe in die Schule, in standard German, is rendered as ich gehe Schule. I was standing in Hermannplatz becomes ich stand Hermannplatz instead of ich stand am Hermannplatz. However, if instead of talking about being in a particular place or motion towards a particular place, we're describing motion away from somewhere, the prepositions and articles become obligatory again. In this way, I'm coming from school in both Kiezdeutsch and regular German is Ich komme aus der Schule. Similarly, Rinkebü, a suburb of Stockholm, which is home to a large multicultural community, has given rise to a variety of Swedish known as Rinkebü Svenska. With loanword slang mainly from Turkish, but also with elements of Kurdish, Arabic, Greek, Persian, Serbian, Croatian, Syriac, Spanish and English. Examples include Giz from Turkish Giz for I, used to mean an attractive person. And Kef, bad, from Arabic Kaf, meaning good. Aina is a negative term for police officer from the Turkish Aynasız. Slang for police officer, literally meaning without a mirror. So they're so shameful that they don't dare look at themselves in a mirror. There are some features that are shared between various kinds of youth language around the world. I mentioned quotatives in MLE earlier, expressions such as, I was like, this is me, I went. Their equivalents in multicultural Parisian French are être là, Faire and être comme ça. Moi, je là, ça va pas, non? I was like, that's out of order. Another common feature is what is known as extenders. Extenders are used to indicate that the previous word or words are part of a set and invite the listener to complete the set in their mind. They can also be used to signal that the speaker is not necessarily completely sure of what they're saying. Furthermore, and this may well be the reason for the extensive use of extenders by adolescents and young adults, their use implies shared knowledge and opinions, and so creates a sense of solidarity. Examples include, and things like that, and all that, and stuff, and all that kind of thing, and then a specifically MLE one, a na. And then in French, et tout, etc., et tout ça, et tout le tralala, et patati et patata. Na, na, na. Another way to sound less sure and direct is to use discourse markers with the purpose of hedging. The most common of these in youth English internationally is like. Hamlet's dad was like dead, yeah? Other markers with a similar purpose are sort of, I mean, kind of. And in French, these are genre, style, mode, façon. For example, les garçons va dire populaire, c'est ceux qui sortent avec les filles et tout. Youth language, like pretty much everything that young people do, is often criticised by people from older generations who like to lament the failings of young people today. Couple linguistic conservatism and prescriptivism with that, and you get the perennial concern that language is doomed. We're all doomed. Remember those medieval kids and their Viking slang? Well, Ranulf Higgin a 14th century Benedictine monk of St. Werbera in Chester, complained as follows. The commixtion and mellying first with Danes and afterward with Normans, in many the contre langage is appeared, and so moveth strange waffling, chittering, hurrying and garrying, grisbitting. And he was right. The language has been so appeared that here we are today and we probably don't even know what a parent means, let alone grisp-bitting. If I were to meet 
Brother Ranulf, though, I might be tempted to point out that words like contre, langage, and strange are exactly the kind of Normanisms he was complaining about. In the preface to the 1780 book A General Dictionary of the English Language, Thomas Sheridan wrote, The total neglect of this art has been productive of the worst consequences in the conduct of all affairs ecclesiastical and civil, in church, in parliament, courts of justice, the wretched state of elocution is apparent to persons of any discernment and taste. If something is not done to stop this growing evil, English is likely to become a mere jargon, which everyone may pronounce as he pleases. Mr Sheridan, on the other hand, is wrong. Here we are, 240 years later, and English is fine, thank you very much. If doomsayers like him were right, the world would be littered with debased languages fallen into ruin, the victims of callous youth speaking as they please. And it isn't, or shall I say it ain't. It amazes me how many times while researching this topic and related projects of mine into the Scots language and African-American vernacular English, that I have heard the following sentiment expressed. They'll never get a job if they talk like that in an interview. In one conversation I saw, the Cockney-speaking mother of an MLE speaker said, one thing that really bothers me about how he talks is I worry no one will ever give him a job. I have several answers to that. Firstly, the proportion of their lives the average person spends in a job interview is very small. It doesn't therefore make much sense to base an entire approach to education on it. Secondly, as many of us have experienced, human beings are perfectly capable of speaking more than one language. In fact, multilingualism is and always has been the norm for the majority of people on the planet. If we don't want kids to miss out on the advantages that standard English or French or German or Swedish bring, we can teach them those varieties in school. What saddens me is the many stories I've heard of kids arriving in school to be told that their language is wrong, ungrammatical, illogical, that the words that they use aren't words. Language is a fascinating and magnificent reflection of human ingenuity, human creativity, and human diversity. Our language is an integral part of our identity and self-worth. To value people, we must value their language. Oh well, you're still here. Thank you so, so much for watching this all the way to the end. Do please subscribe and like, etc., and share this with all your friends. Check out these other videos of mine that you might like. Bye for now.